We're talking about famous verses from the Bible. We'll be in the Old Testament. I uh, want to mention to Erica and, and Tyler, don't leave tonight after service. I have something I'd like to give you. And uh, we're just blessed to be in the Father's house. Amen? Amen? Blessed to be in the Father's house. And we're going to go to Exodus chapter 3. Tonight we're looking at the burning bush. I mean, what fam- you can't preach on famous verses from the Bible without talking about the burning bush. And I'm going to share some things tonight that uh, has always kind of, um, in fact, it just puzzled me some things that uh, God said to Moses. One of those things that troubled me was God told Moses to take his shoes off, the place he was standing, his holy ground. That always kind of troubled me a little bit because I didn't understand what implication was there. And tonight, when you leave here, you're going to say, oh, that's why he had to take his shoes off. And what a blessing it is to gather together in the house of the Lord. Let's all stand Exodus chapter 3. We're going to begin reading with verse 1. We're going to read down to verse 6. Then we're going to skip the Hittites, the Jebusites, the Gerzites, the Hivites, and the uh, Termites, and the Goodnites, and the Nohelites. And we're going to pick up again at verse 10 of this chapter. Verse 1, now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Let me stop right here. Moses did not have a flock of sheep of his own. He had the flock of his father's sheep. So did Jesus. He had the flock of his father. His father-in-law, the priest of the Midian, and he, fed, he led the flock of the, to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even Horeb. That is also Mount Sinai. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that Moses had turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here am am I. And he said, draw not nigh or hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, and Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Verse 10, come now, therefore, and I will send you unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses said unto God, who am I, that I should go to Pharaoh? that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. And he said, Certainly, I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the, the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come to the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? And they shall, and what shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. I want to use for a subject tonight the burning bush. You may be seated. There's some things in this chapter that I want to bring out that's very important because most of us in our life will stand at a burning bush. Some of you right now are standing at a burning bush. Some of you are being burned up with anxiety or grief or turbulence in your life. You've got to understand that Moses' life was divided into three segments. Forty years in Egypt, he got his um, first degree, his college degree, his doctor degree in Egyptian 
uh, trade and wisdom. And uh, for 40 years, he was in Egypt. He learned the language of the, uh, of the Egyptians, and of course, he knew the language of the Hebrews as well. And for 40 years, he lived in the palace. Now he's going to leave the palace and go to the uh, wilderness, I guess from the palace to the outhouse. And he goes 40 more years in the desert. So he leaves Egypt as a prince, and then he goes into the wilderness as a, uh, a shepherd, just someone working his father's sheep there to the out part of the desert. And 40 years he spent there. So he's 80 years old, and at 80 years old, he receives a burning bush. He sees a bush burning. And God says, I'm going to send you to Egypt, back to Egypt. And you're going to bring my people out with my hand of power. And Moses spends another 40 years trapped with those complaining, fussing, doubting, wanting to stone him, fussing, murmuring Israel's in the wilderness, 40 years in the wilderness. And finally, God had mercy on Moses and put him to sleep on Mount Nebo so he could finally rest in peace and be with the God in whom he loved and served. So there's three segments there, and, and I want to share with you, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I, I want you to understand the burning bush. It's important that we understand the burning bush. One thing we need to understand, first of all, the burning bush, it being on fire was not an unusual thing. Because in the desert, it's hot, it's dry, it's barren, but there's a lightning storm, bushes caught a fire. So it wasn't unusual for a bush to be on fire in the desert where Moses was. He's in the backside of the desert keeping his sheep. And it wasn't unusual for a bush to be on fire because that happened on a regular ba basis because these thorns, these thorny bushes were combustible. And the heat would come, the drought would come, and things would cause them to ignite. What made this bush unusual is that if anyone knows anything about a bramble bush or a, or a bush of thorns or a dried up bush, you know that when they burn, they only burn for a few seconds and they're gone, poof, done. And what fascinated Moses is this bush just kept burning and it never was consumed. I mean, it burned and burned and burned and Moses probably looked up tending the sheep and saw this bush burning and says, It'll be gone. He looks up again, and it's still burning. A few, few minutes later, he looks up again. The thing's still burning. He looks up again. The thing's still burning. And Moses saying, whoa, I've got to check this out. This bush is burning. It's not being consumed. And so Moses makes his way to where the bush was, and God was in the bush. Now, some of you right now, you're standing before a burning bush. Understand that Moses ran from Egypt because he had killed an Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Moses had been rejected by Pharaoh and by the Egyptians, and he had committed murder, and, and Moses was a fugitive. They probably had his picture on pillars in Egypt saying, wanted, uh, you know, reward. Pharaoh will give you, I don't know, so many shekels, so much gold. He was a, he was a, he was a running convict. And so he just wanted to run away and just forget his past. That's Moses. He ran away and wanted to hide from Pharaoh because he was wanted for murder. He killed an Egyptian, buried him in the sand. Uh, anybody got any brains that know this? You don't bury someone in the sand because they'll come up. And later on, they, of course, Moses was seen killing this Egyptian. And when he was found out, he ran. He ran into, into the desert, ran to hide, wanted to leave his past behind. I want you to know your past may be very pitifully ugly, and maybe you've done some things in your life you shouldn't have done. 
And you maybe have run from that. You'd like to hide from that. So you've run away. You're in the desert. And you just want to start a new life for your, of your own. Moses just wanted to start a new life and forget his past. But God shows up in a burning bush and says, uh, you got to deal with this problem. Moses, I'm sending you back to Egypt. What? Yeah, you're going back to Egypt. And the truth is, some of us in this room, maybe we're standing before a burning bush. We don't understand it, but it just keeps burning. You think it'll go away over it. My dad used to tell me, well, you know, I'm going through a stressful time. My dad used to tell me, well, go on to bed, son. When you wake up in the morning, it'll be better. I woke up in the morning. It wasn't better. And my dad was real good at telling me, go to bed, get up in the morning, it'll be better. And he lied to me every time he said that because going to bed don't fix it. Hello? Anybody knows anything about depression and discouragement? Going to bed don't fix it. And so Moses has ran, and the bush is burning. Now, you need to understand that this bush, um, the Hebrews, um, you'll not find this in the Bible, but the, but the Hebrews believed because of the terrain of the desert that more than likely this was like a bramble or a, a thicket of thorns that was burning. And so when you look at the bush that's burning, it's a, it's a bush of thorns. You know that they burn quickly, and Moses says, what's unusual about this bush, it, it hasn't burned out. It just keeps burning, and it never, it's consumed. And so Moses checks it out. He, he turns to see this sight. And I want you to know that that burning bush is a symbol of the, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for he too had a crown of thorns upon his head. And he was burned under the wrath of God on the cross of Calvary. And Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross of Calvary, and he burned under the judgment of God, yet he was not consumed. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. A crown of thorns on his head, yes, and the wrath of God consuming, but yet on that cross, the fire of God fell, yet Jesus Christ continues to live. Jesus Christ died on that cross, but up from the grave he arose. Hallelujah. He ever lived to make intercession for you and I. He lives, he lives, he lives. And that burning bush is a picture of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Woo! Dying on that cross, raising again from the dead. He's alive. Yes. Amen. So the burning bush is a picture of Jesus Christ. And the I am inside of that bush is also a picture of Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the great I am. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ said, I am the light of the world. Jesus Christ said, I am the true vine. Jesus Christ said, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus Christ went on and on and on and said, I am. When they come to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane, they said, we're looking for this, this, this person uh, called Jesus. Uh, are you Jesus? And he turns to those that's coming to arrest him, those, those uh, temple police. And, he, and Jesus turns to them and says, I am he. Boom, they fell to the ground because the great I am spoke. I am he. We're going to pick that up in just a little bit, but I want us to see the importance of understanding the burning bush. Moses comes to the burning bush to get a look, and he finds that Jesus, he didn't know the great I am as Jesus, but he knew that God was in that bush. And God speaks to Moses from that bush, calls him by name, Moses, Moses. Uh, yeah, Moses, I know you were in the bulrush. Yeah, Moses, I know uh, your, your mama put you in the, in the Nile. You, yeah, Moses, I know you're a Hebrew. Yeah, Moses, I know who you are. Moses, Moses, I know who you are, and I know what you're going to become. God is telling Moses that. Maybe you don't know who you are, but God knows who you are, so take good courage. Sometimes I don't even know who I am. I go through a hard time and say, who am I? Man, I'm nothing. I know that. And so we look at the bush. And when Moses comes to the bush and he looks, he finds that God is in that bush. And Jesus Christ was in Jesus, uh, God was in Jesus Christ um, reconciling the world unto himself. So God was in Jesus. Jesus 
in this bush type of Christ, typology. And as Moses gets close, look at verse 4 through 6, um, God tells him to take off his shoes. Now, look at verse 4. It says, And when the Lord saw that he turned aside, he called unto him out of the midst of the bush, and Moses, Moses, and he said, Here am I. And he said, God said, Draw not nigh, neither uh, hither. Put off your shoes from off your feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Now, that used to bother me a great deal. I have preached hundreds of sermons over the years, and I have mentioned uh, taking shoes off. Preachers take, uh, I was in a meeting one time that the house was packed and the preacher had everybody take their shoes off. And well, I would do that here, but the ventilation's not good enough. <laughs> Hello. Kind of like the guy that went to the store and got some odor eaters, put them in his shoes, and they eat his feet off. Anyway, but God, Moses approaches the bush, and God says, Moses, Moses, Moses stops. He says, Moses, take your shoes off. Don't you come any closer. I used to wonder, well, why do you take your shoes off? I know preachers that take their shoes off when they preach, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but um, I don't think God was saying, take your shoes off, Moses, make yourself comfortable. Hello? I know people has got that interpretation in their mind. Well, you take your shoes off because you're comfortable. You're at home. You're with Father. That's not the teaching here. When Moses stands before that bush, God says, I want you to take your shoes off because the place you're at is holy ground. You are approaching a holy God. You're approaching me. Now, he said, I want you to take your shoes off because you are approaching me. Now, the question would be, why did he take his shoes off? And I've got an answer for that. And, and I'll, I'll just give you the point here, first of all. Why the shoe evacuation? Why the shoe evacuation? And I've got a good answer for that. Because Moses is on the backside of the desert. There were storms. There was jagged rocks. There was all kinds of... Uh, probably burrs and different kinds of instruments and different kinds of things on the ground. And God was saying, Moses, take your shoes off because I don't want you to have the ability to walk any closer to me. You got your shoes off, you're not going to walk across Texas goat heads. You got your shoes off, somebody don't know what a Texas goat head is, but anyway, uh, how many know what them are? Well, we got... Four intelligent people in the building. But anyway, uh, you know, if, if you take your shoes off, you're not going to be able to walk on this. You, you didn't run around in the desert where Moses was without shoes on because there's jagged rocks, there's, there's burrs, there's, there's storms. And God was trying to say to Moses, don't you come any closer. I want you to understand, and I put this down so you won't forget it. I wrote this down. Don't come any closer because God wants to make it harder. We need to make it harder to walk into the presence of God in the flesh. Make it hard for your fleshly steps to approach God. That's the message there. Make it hard for your fleshly steps to approach God. I, I'm afraid that there's churches all over America that is making it too easy for fleshly steps to approach God. We need to understand that the flesh will never please God. And we need to understand that the steps, Moses couldn't take any more steps he wanted to because he's barefooted. God is seeing to it that Moses can't take any more steps on that jagged ground. And that's why God told Moses to take his shoes off. Because God's going to make it harder for Moses, impossible actually, to walk closer to God. Now, if that doesn't 
speak to you, then you need to go home and read your Bible for the rest of the night. Because God is trying to lay down a principle here. He's telling Moses, you're not going to walk into my presence fleshly steps. I'm going, to, I'm going to come down, and I'm going to use you to go to Egypt, and I'm going to have you bring my people back to this mountain. And they're going to learn how to approach me in the spirit, not in the flesh. That's what Moses is saying. That's what God is saying to Moses, rather. God is telling Moses, I'm going to teach the people the law. You see, I have a plan. God says, I have a plan. My plan is, I've come down, you haven't come up. My plan is, I'm coming down, I'm going to set a holy standard. I'm going to set the holy law of God. I'm going to set the holy principle of God. I'm coming down. I'm going to deliver people. I'm going to gather around Mount Sinai. I'm going to bring types and pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to show them I'm their deliverer. I'm going to show them miracles across uh, the wilderness. I'm going to show them miracles across to the promised land. I'm going to show them how to approach the promised land and do it in a way that honors only God. Now, we could stop right there. We're not going to, but we could stop right there and say we've had church. How many would agree that that is really a good, that's a good interpretation of why God told Moses to take his shoes off? It wasn't that, well, Moses, don't you feel it? No, he'd felt it if he tried to walk any closer. That's what it was. And, and God wants you to feel it if you try to walk any closer in the fleshly steps. He wants you to make it hard, harder for you to approach him because he's a holy God. You tell him, Moses, don't you walk any closer. Don't you come any further toward me because the place you're at, we used to say that ground is holy, and it does say the ground you're here is holy, but he's talking about approaching God is holy ground. Approaching God is holy ground. Where God is, it is holy, but when you approach God, it is holy ground. Amen? I think it's important that we understand, too, that God was just saying, hold it right there. And Moses had, you know, in his mind, he thought God had forsaken Israel. In his mind, he's out there in the desert. He's, you know, he's standing before a burning bush, and he's, uh, he's guilty, and he, he, he's, he's miserable, and he's had a hard life. And here he is standing before the burning bush, and all of a sudden, God speaks to him and says, I know your name. I'm caught up with you. You're a fugitive. I'm going to send you back to where you killed that Egyptian and buried him in the sand. Now, I don't know about you, but that probably terrified Moses. Hello? Now, I want everybody to grasp what's happening here because God is sending Moses back to approach Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh to let God's people go. The announcement is very clear that Pharaoh was to let the people go. Now, we know that in verse 11, it says that God said to, that Moses said to God, verse 11, and Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? So the question is, who am I? It's not who you are, it's who God is. And when Moses said, who am I? Immediately, we live in a church world today and a society today that we want to be pepped up, pep talk, how great we are. Moses, God did not tell Moses. When Moses said, who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh and tell, to let the people of Israel go. God didn't say, now, 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 Moses, you're special. Now, 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 Moses, you are, you've been born for this deed. Now, Moses, nothing's impossible with you. Moses, you're so good. You've been trained in Egypt. Moses, you're an awesome character. Don't put yourself down. You are, you are made for this hour. You are a spectacular individual. God did not give Moses a pep talk. 
And the last thing I want to hear from a preacher if I'm sitting in the auditorium is to hear a pep talk of how good I am. I know how good I am. I know how bad I am. I know that I am nothing without God. I don't need a pep talk about how good I am. I don't need a pep talk about how I can achieve this or I can be rich or I can have this or I can go here, that I'm special. God didn't tell Moses, now Moses, you're awesome. Moses, you're incredible. The one thing God told Moses is, I will be with you. I don't need someone pep talking me to tell me how great I am or how special I am. All I need is a preacher to stand up every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, every revival meeting, that God will never leave me nor forsake me, that God is with me and that God will be with me through my hard times, be with me through my good times, that God will be with me in my storms, God will be with me in my grief and my sorrows, that God is there. And if God is silent, if God is silent, that doesn't mean he's absent. That's right. And so when God says to Moses, I want you to go to Egypt, and I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Spare me the pep talk, how good I am. Tell me how good God is. Spare me the pep talk of how great we are. As children of God, tell me how great God is who redeemed us into the family of God. Spare me the nonsense that's being shoveled out to our churches like peas off a shovel, telling our people in the churches that we are, in some way, God is honored and God, you know, God is so, so blessed to have us. Wrong theology, wrong way. We need to let everybody know that God is awesome. John Newton in his dying breath, he was so weak, he wrote Amazing Grace. I think it will be the national anthem in heaven. Amazing Grace. John Newton, a slave trader. John Newton, a wicked man. He'd raped the slaves, he would curse every breath. He was a murderer, he hated God. He'd stand at the, uh, at the front of the ship and scream at God, shake his fist at God and tell God, I hate you. I don't believe in you, but if you're there, I despise you. Yet God got a hold of John Newton and God saved him and gave him eternal life. And in the dying breath of John Newton, when he began to lose his memory, he began, this is what he said in his dying breath. I know two things. I can't remember my life, but I remember two things. That I am a great sinner, and Jesus is a great Savior. That's amazing grace. Amen? How many, how many ready for some more good stuff? God gives Moses a name. God just drops a name on Moses. Exodus 3, verse 13 and uh, uh, 14. And, and Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come into the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am. I am and that I am. If you need strength, that I am. If you need bread, that I am. If you need deliverance, that I am. If you need life, that I am. If you need resurrection, that I am. He said, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me. Wow. What a name. You say, well, that's not a name. Yeah, it is. There is no equal to God. There is no one like God. There's not even, not even the angels can compare to God. God is in a, a place of his own. God is preexisting. God is everlasting. No one is like God. No one can even come close to God. No one can even compare to God. 
He's one of his own. No wonder God said, I am. What's your name? I am. And by the way, God puts the I am in every Christian. And what he means by putting the I am in every Christian, he puts the awareness that we are. If it wasn't for God, we wouldn't know that we're even alive. Amen? We'd be aimless and blind, even dumber than a chicken. And that's pretty dumb. Although at my house, there's some smart chickens. Because they come to the door and they peck, peck, peck because they want handouts. Those chickens, when they were babies, Judy raised them in a heat lamp. And when those little chickens growed up, Judy took them out and put them in the chicken house. Those babies, Judy petted those babies. She petted them baby chickens more than she petted me. And those little chickens began to adore Judy. And Judy just petted them, and they'd run up to her to get petted. And, and, and Judy just give them all names. And when they were young, the sun started to go down, and it started to get dark. And they'd run to the door because Mama had to put them to bed on the roost. They actually would come to the door, peck on the door, because they wanted Mama to put them to bed. Now, I don't know whether Mama sung a bedtime story to them on the roost or not, but I know this. They knew that Mama would take care of them, and they, she would take them and put them on the roost. Now they come up and they beg and want us to throw food out to them. I could tell you other stories about Judy, but I'm not going to go there because I want to live a little older. I... <laughs> I, I'd like to survive a few more months of life. And that, I could tell you a story about the rooster, but we're not going to go there. My next book is going to be written about Judy and the rooster. I don't know when I'm going to get around to writing it, probably uh, when I'm about ready to die. But anyway, write a, a book about the rooster. But anyway... You need to understand that when God said, I am, there is no equal. We are aware that we're alive because God is life. We're aware that we're in this room because God gives us that awareness. We are alive right here in this room. If it wasn't for God, you could not say, I am. But up here on this platform, I am. Out there in that auditorium, you're sitting there, you can say, I am. I am. I can say, I am. My name is James. But God can say, I am everything that exists, everything that shall be, everything that has ever been. I am. Isn't that beautiful? Then Jesus comes along using words like that. I am the light of the world. Jesus comes along and says, I am the true vine. Jesus comes along and says, I am the bread of life. If you eat of this bread, you'll not hunger. I'm the water of life. Jesus comes along and saying, I am, I am, I am. Every time Jesus turned around, he was saying, I am. I am. I am the resurrection and the life. I am he that liveth and was dead. I am he. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am who I said I am. In fact, the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they, um, they tried to tell Jesus, well, you, you, you make yourself to be God. They, they tried to tell Jesus, you talk about all these things, you are the life and the way, the truth and the life. And the Pharisees are saying, you're lying. And Jesus Christ said, no, 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 no. I'm the big fat liar if I don't tell you the truth. Amen. And by the way, any preacher that don't tell you the truth is a big fat liar or a coward one or both. But here's what Jesus Christ said in John chapter 8. John chapter 8. This is a beautiful passage of Scripture. John chapter 8, verse 56, 57, and 58. Jesus Christ says, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it. And was glad. 
Then they said, the Jews said unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old. Hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And I guarantee you, when he said that, they remembered the burning bush. I guarantee you, when he said that, I am, they remembered the burning bush. And I want you to know, if you're standing before a burning bush right now, God's not going to make it easy for you to get to him in steps of flesh. It means repentance. It means contrition. It means spiritual awakening. But God's going to allow you to come to him, but only in spirit and truth. You can't step in the steps of flesh You've got to step in the steps of Jesus Christ. So when Jesus Christ said, I am, that I am, he was saying, I'm it. I'm I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's no one but me. I'm it. No one can go to heaven without me. I'm it. That's what Jesus is saying. No one will ever go to heaven without me, Jesus is saying. I'm it. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And so the burning bush is extremely important to us today. I mean, we'd agree with that. The burning bush is very important to us today because we need to understand that it's not some kind of toy, toy, uh, woohoo, meeting we're getting together and kicking our shoes off and dancing across the auditorium. That's that, the bare feet isn't about that. Taking your shoes off at the burning bush isn't about, woohoo, I feel God. Well, you take a few steps and you'll feel something else. Moses was instructed, take your shoes off, because God was trying to say to Moses, you're not going to take another step toward me. I want you to make it hard to take another step toward me, because flesh cannot please God. And God is saying, I'm going to send you over there to Egypt, and I'm going to give you the whole gospel from the beginning to the end, and I'm going to sum it up with my son Jesus that says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then I'm going to bring the grand finale in Revelation chapter 1. I am he that liveth. I am he that was dead and liveth. I am he that holds the keys, the death, hell, and the grave. I am. That's it. That's it. I want to say to everybody in this room, Because Jesus is so wonderfully good, we have hope beyond this room. We have hope beyond this life. And you may be standing at a burning bush right now. You you don't like it. The burning bush, everybody everybody seems to think the burning bush was an exciting, wonderful time. Well, yeah, it was exciting, but not for Moses. You got to go back to where you came from. Everybody wants to make the burning bush a woohoo experience. No, it's actually a time of repentance. It's actually a time of reevaluation. It's actually a time of really entering into the divine presence and the real awesome holiness of God. So next time you hear someone preach about chasing after that burning bush experience, I got news for you. You don't have to chase it. God knew where Moses was and God came to Moses. And you don't have to chase that burning bush experience because God has you in his sights. God will chase you. Salvation isn't you going to God. Salvation is God coming to you. And you will face the burning bush experience. How many would agree that this is a famous verse of Scripture from the Bible? It's incredible. Amen? And so I'm thankful for the grace of God, thankful for the mercy of God. I haven't said a whole lot because of Eric and Tyler going through a very stressful time right now. But, I, you know, I, I, I love my brother Steve. Um, he used to attend church here. He, he was called to preach here, my brother Steve Akins, And he went to the Chadwick Union Church. And some of you went to the Union Church. And, and brother Steve was a, a great guy, very, a, a man that was very detailed in salvation, things of God. And I'm so encouraged that that Steve and my brother 
baptized Tanner. Because that encourages me. Because I know that Steve was a man of detail. And, you know, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for God's mercy. I'm grateful that God is a sovereign God. Amen. Hallelujah. Stand with me. We're going to give an invitation. How many, I want to show of hands, and I really want to know, how many ever thought, there's got to be more to this taking your shoes off than just God's, would you, you ever thought that? There's got to be more than just taking your shoes off and there's the presence of God. And there, and there is. God was saying it's much deeper than that. Moses, you take your shoes off so you can't come to me any closer. Because we can't come to God any closer in flesh. We must come to God in spirit, in truth. Amen. But you never heard a sermon about the burning bush like this before. But I guarantee you the truth is there. The great analogy is there. The, the, the thing is, God says, I'm going to bring him back in Egypt. I'm going to go to this exact mountain. I'm going to bring you right to this exact burning bush. I'm bring you right back here to Mount Sinai. I'm bring you right here to Mount Horeb. And right here, I'm going to teach my people how to approach me in spirit and truth through the law of God, to the things of God. We're going to get an inv invitation tonight. tonight. And... Uh, Whatever you're going through, you may be standing in a burning bush. I, I hate, honestly, you know, there's preachers everywhere saying, I love standing in a burning bush. Not me. Not me. I'm not looking for burning bushes. But I am looking for God's presence. I do want God to touch my life. I do want God to minister to my need. But I'm not out here looking for frillies or extra things that would come my way. Because I know who I am. I want to know who he is. I know. I don't need a pep talk. And there's churches everywhere the preachers are giving them pep talks. Oh, you can do it. You're incredible. You're amazing. You were made for this hour. You are a, a, an amazing human being that God has made you to be rich, wealthy, and intelligent, and powerful. Oh, cheer up. You are something special. I don't need a pep talk like that. I need to hear God's word. I'll be with you, Moses. I'll be with you. God didn't give him a pep talk. He said, I'll be with you. Was Moses a great prophet? Yes. Did Moses do great things? Yes. <laughs> but God didn't talk about it much. You know what God said right after Moses died? Uh, my servant's dead. God didn't say my great orator's dead. God didn't say my great man of God is dead. God didn't say my great orator, my great... Uh, song writer, psalms writer, my great leader's dead. God said, my servant Moses is dead. He didn't even give a pep talk about him in his death. Because it's not about Moses. It's about our Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, I can turn the coin on that and say, well, you know, you hear preachers say, well, it's not about us. You hear preachers say, well, it's not about the preacher. You hear people say, well, it's not about us. It's about him. And that's true. But then again, we got to stop and say, wait a minute. It is about us because God so loved the world. He loved us. He came to die for us. So it is about us in many aspects. But we need to remember that it's all about knowing presence of God, walking in the presence of God. Did you learn something tonight? Are you glad you came? Praise the Lord. We're going to give an invitation. We're going to believe God for healing and blessing, encouragement. The altar's open. You make your way.